Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Today we're gonna to look at a really nice but strange differential equation. So the differential equation in question is a second order nonlinear differential equation. And the fact that it's a nonlinear differential equation in the first place, means that there's probably some trick to solve it. Otherwise, it would just plain be not solvable. So in this case, we have y double prime over y prime squared equals y over y squared minus one. And I'd like to point out that this is an example of an autonomous differential equation. So an autonomous differential equation is one where you only see the dependent variable and you do not see the independent variable. So if we're assuming here that the dependent variable is y, obviously, and the independent variable is x, notice there are no x's that are kind of freely available in this differential equation. They're all wrapped up within y or y prime or y double prime. Another thing that I'd like to point out to maybe inspire you to stay until the end is that something seems a bit sketchy about the final solution of this differential equation. And maybe we'll give a little bit of a hint of what's going on there. Okay, so let's get started. So I'll first notice that I've got a y prime squared in the denominator of the left-hand side. Then if I multiply that up to the right-hand side, I have a pure differential. I've got a function of y times y prime. So that would motivate us to take the antiderivative using something like the chain rule. So let's do that. So making that multiplication gives us y double prime over y prime equals y times y prime over y squared minus one. But now let's notice that this left-hand side is really just some sort of logarithmic derivative of y prime. So I can write that as the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of y prime. And why is that? Well, that's because the derivative of the natural log will send this thing downstairs, this y prime, and the derivative of y prime is y double prime. And something pretty similar is also happening over here on the right-hand side. Notice the derivative of the denominator is almost the numerator. It's equal to the numerator up to a constant of two. And that's because the derivative of y squared is two y times y prime. So that motivates us to write this as one half and then the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of y squared minus one. So we have something like that. Okay, so let's talk our way through this to make sure we know what's going on. So taking the derivative of the natural log, we'll send this y squared minus one downstairs. And then the derivative of the inside will give us two y, y prime by the chain rule and then the half cancels that two that comes out. Okay, nice. Now I'm gonna rewrite this a little bit. I'm gonna rewrite this as the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of y prime. So I guess I'm not rewriting this left-hand side at all. And then I'll use the fact that the derivative operator is a linear operator. That means I can bring this one half inside the derivative operator. And then furthermore, after bringing it inside the derivative operator, I can bring it inside the natural log and it will become a one half exponent of this y squared minus one. But let's recall that a one half exponent is a square root. So in the end, we have this is equal to the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of the square root of y squared minus one. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. But now let's notice we've got the derivative of a function equals the derivative of another function. But that means that these are both antiderivatives of the same function, which means they must differ by just a constant. So that means we can write this left-hand side without the derivative, in other words, the natural log of y prime, as this right-hand side, the natural log of the square root of y squared minus one plus some constant. But since everything's within a natural log here, I'm gonna write that constant as the natural log of some number a. 
And you might say, well, that really restricts the types of constants that I can use here. But in fact, it really doesn't because the natural log is an on to function. Now, of course, there is something problematic going on with the fact that we can't have y prime equal to zero because it's in the denominator over here. We can't have y equal to plus or minus one because it's in the denominator over there. But again, like I said, we're gonna play it fast and loose here. Okay, now we can use logarithm rules to combine these two so we can combine the sum of two logarithms into the logarithm of a product. That leaves us with the log of a times the square root of y squared minus one. But that's great because now we've got a pure logarithm on the left hand side and a pure logarithm on the right hand side, meaning that we have the left hand side without the logarithm is equal to the right hand side without the logarithm. So we're left with something like that. But now we can use the separation of variables technique in order to solve this newly formed differential equation, which notice is now a first order differential equation. All of this had the result of reducing the second order differential equation to a first order differential equation. And maybe now is a good time to point out that if you wanna learn more about differential equations, I'm actually building an entire course of lecture videos plus problem solving videos involving differential equations over on the second channel math major. So go check that out. Anyway, I'll write y prime is dy by dx and then abusing notation, that means I can write dy over the square root of y squared minus one equals a dx and then take the antiderivative of both sides of that. But I think we're running out of room, so let's maybe bring that over here and then we'll finish it off. If you're looking to start your own domain, personal website, or online store, look no further than Squarespace. Squarespace offers easy to use drag and drop features that make web design a breeze. Squarespace has tons of templates that offer awesome customization options with no coding required. Although you can access the code if you'd like. There's even easy LaTeX integration like I have on my website. So what are you waiting for? Go check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Michael Penn to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And one last time, thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So I took where we finished on the last board and I brought it over here. I also like took the antiderivative of both sides. So the right hand side was really just a linear function. So taking the antiderivative was easy. In fact, it was just a constant function. Now the left hand side requires a little bit of work. So I've just symbolically anti-differentiated it here. And now we'll actually do the calculation. So motivated by the fact that we've got this y squared minus one in the denominator, we'll make a change of variables using a trig substitution. So we'll set y equal to the secant of theta. That means dy is equal to the secant of theta times the tangent of theta d theta. And furthermore, it means the square root of y squared minus one is equal to the tangent of theta by trigonometric identities. Okay, so now if we take this entire substitution and plug it into our integral, what do we have? Well, I'll just extend the equality over in this direction. And let's notice portion of our dy uh, involves a tangent. This thing in the denominator, the square root of y squared minus one also involves a tangent. Those will cancel and we'll just have a secant theta d theta. But now the secant theta has a trick for integration. We won't go over that here. That's something that you would learn in a standard first type of calculus course. So this has an antiderivative of the natural log of secant theta plus tangent theta. Great, but putting that back in terms of y, we have the natural log of secant theta, which was y plus tangent theta, which was the square root of y squared minus one. So root y squared minus one. Okay, great. But now let's see what we have. Let's underline the important parts here. We have this natural log of y plus root y squared minus one equals ax plus b. So that tells us that y plus root y squared minus one equals e to the ax plus b, but I can rewrite that as capital B times e to the ax, 
where capital B is equal to E to the lowercase b, using exponent rules to simplify that out a little bit. And now let's take this right here and this right here and start to solve for y, which looks a little bit intimidating, but it really isn't that bad. We'll notice that the square root of y squared minus one is the same thing as b times e to the ax minus y. Now we can square both sides, and that'll leave us with y squared minus 1. The square kills the square root over here on the left-hand side. Equals b squared e to the 2a, that's from squaring this, minus 2y times b times e to the ax. That's our cross term from multiplying out this binomial, and then plus y squared, so plus y squared. So now let's note that the y squared here cancels the y squared here, and we've got a linear equation for y. So let's look at that linear equation for y. We have negative 1 equals this b squared times e to the 2a x minus 2y b to the e, b times e to the ax. So let's bring that up and then we'll write down a final solution and discuss this sketchiness. So this is where we left ourselves off. Now we can solve this really quickly for our dependent variable y. So let's see, we'll get 2y times b times e to the ax equals b squared e to the 2ax plus one. And now we can divide by two times b times e to the ax, and that'll be y equals b squared e to the two ax plus one over two times b times e to the ax. Now let's further simplify in even more and note that we can get y equals, well the b squared will cancel with the b just giving us b, e to the ax, canceling the two ax with the ax in that exponent, and then we'll have plus one over b, e to the minus ax, and then this is all over two. Okay, so let's maybe put a nice box around that because I think that looks like a pretty good final solution. And now let's notice that if b and a are equal to one, then that implies y equals the hyperbolic cosine of x. We've got e to the x plus e to the minus x over two. That's exactly the definition of the hyperbolic cosine. But then you can also kind of check just by plugging these functions in that y equals sine of x and y equals cosine of x are also solutions. We can in fact achieve this cosine of x when b is equal to one and a is equal to the imaginary unit i. And I believe we can achieve this sine of x when, let's see, I think we'll need b equal to one over i and we'll need a equal to i as well, just like in the cosine case. Okay, so I guess what I'm getting at here is it looks like we've got three solutions. We've got this hyperbolic cosine. You can also check maybe hyperbolic sine is also a solution. This regular cosine and this regular sine. And those are three linearly independent functions, but we only have a second order differential equation here. So that's where the sketchiness is coming in. Like how do we have three independent solutions for only a second and order differential equation. So maybe post in the comments if you have an idea of what's going on here. And that's a good place to stop.